Hey, everybody. Welcome to Red May, your one-month vacation from capitalism. We are exactly halfway through our program. Before we get on to today's event, I want to clue you into some of the things that are coming up. Um, tomorrow at 11 a.m., Beyond Oppression and Exploitation with Ashley Borer, Michael Hart, Chandon Reddy, and Ico Day. Uh, at uh, 5 p.m., The Asset Economy and the Logic of Speculation, uh, with Martin Konings and Lisa Atkins coming all the way from Australia. Stephen Shaviro, I'll be moderating that one. Uh, on Thursday at 11 a.m., we have a conversation between Sandro Mazadra in Italy and Jason Reed in Maine on Marx producing subjects. And on Thursday at 6 p.m., we have How to Weaponize or Diffuse a Constitution. Uh, that has Aziz Rana and Camila Vergara, both of whom have written exciting new books on constitutions. Uh, Richard Kreitner, who has a book called Break It Up about uh, succession from the United States, its history. And I'll also be moderating that. On uh, Friday at uh, 3 p.m., Lux, a new feminist, socialist feminist women's magazine is doing a panel called Starting a Socialist Feminist Women's Magazine. So if you wanna know how to do that, come hear Sarah Leonard, Marion Jones, Tammy Kim, Cheryl Rivera, and Sharanya Dervasala. Uh, and Friday at uh, 6 p.m. we have Theorizing the Present, the Revolutionary Foresight of Black Communist Women, and the speakers include Sharice burden Stelly, Jody Dean, and Ashley Farmer as the moderator. Uh, it happens to be Sharice burden Stelly's birthday today. So from all of us here, happy birthday, Sharice. We'll see you on Friday. Uh, you might wonder how we're able to put on 43 events with over 110 speakers. Uh, we must have a large budget for uh, institutional backing. Ah, uh, sadly, no. Uh, an event as communist as this has no backing in the United States. We depend on your generosity. And you can express that uh, if you go to the description of the YouTube event, there's a link which will take you to our Patreon uh, where you can give it three, five, 10 or $20 a month uh, or to our GoFundMe, Fan the Frames of Red May. Uh, you can also go directly to our website at www.redmayseattle.org. Uh, also, we need volunteers. So you can sign up on our website for volunteers, uh, either for the rest of this year or for next year when we go hopefully live again and bring people actually to Seattle as well as having an online component. Uh, but enough of that, let's get on to the main event now. Uh, I'm really happy to uh, have this panel on revolutionary and counter-revolutionary internationalism. Uh, and I want to introduce the... Uh, the moderator of this panel, panel Lubna Alzaru, was a grad student at the University of Washington. Am I, am I correct in that, Lubna? I, I, I don't have I'm, my... Uh... I'm no longer a graduate student. I graduated Oh, no, you're teaching. Now, where are you teaching? You're teaching at, at which community college are you teaching at? The South Seattle Community College. And um, I can South Seattle, that. okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, Lubna is uh, going to... Uh, introduce our event with an invocation with the help of uh, Red May alum, Nick Estes, uh, who was also one of the panelists. So I'll, I'll bring you both on and you can introduce the rest of the panelists uh, as they speak. And uh, welcome to Red May, everybody. I'm very excited about this talk coming up. Okay, thank you, Philip, for inviting me to moderate this panel. Um, so before we start the introdu introductions, I think we want to start with some acknowledgments. So Nick, do you want to start us off? Sure. So I normally don't do a land acknowledgments. <laughs> um, I, I'm firmly for land back. So uh, unless you're going to make a commitment to actually returning the things that you've taken or that your government has taken, what's the point of an acknowledgement other than maybe just pulling up in somebody's car after you stole it and telling them, hey, I stole your car. But nonetheless, it's important to learn where you're from uh, and whose land you sit upon. Uh, so I'm calling here uh, from Tiwa territory, which is uh, you know traditional territory of the Tiwa people, but it's also a crossroads for many indigenous nations, also known as uh, the, uh, the city of Albuquerque. I also posted in the um, 
chat, uh, nativeland.ca. So if you want to chime in um, where, you're, where you're calling from, just go to nativeland.ca to see which indigenous territory you are in, drop it in the chat, um, give an acknowledgement, give, an, give a shout out, but also more importantly, <laughs> commit to getting land back. Yes, I completely agree. Um, as Takan Yang uh, say, decolonization is not a metaphor. Um, for those of us in Seattle, um, we also acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories of the Duwamish people. Um, so also, I would also like to acknowledge um, as a Palestinian that uh, the violence and the ethnic cleansing in Palestine, um, a lot of us are hearing currently about Palestine. Yesterday was the 73rd anniversary of the Nakba. Uh, the people of Sheikh Jarrah are currently fighting the ethnic cleansing of their neighborhood in Jerusalem. Uh, Palestinians in Israel are being lynched and people in Gaza are being bombed. They have been every night for the past five nights. Uh, this is all happening uh, because of settler colonialism. Um, it's happening uh, using our uh, tax dollars. Um, and so um, please um, raise awareness and um, talk to your representatives. So um, to start us off. Um, we're going to actually start with Nick. Um, so we'll be hearing first from Nick Estes. He is a Kui Shasha and a citizen of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe. He is an assistant professor in the American Studies Department at the University of New Mexico. Um, his research engages colonialism and global indigenous histories with a focus on decolonization, environmental justice, anti-capitalism, and the Ocheti Shakoen. Um, Estes is the author of Our History is the Future, No Dapple, Standing Rock, and the Long Traditions of Indigenous Resistance, which places into historical context the indigenous-led movement to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and I will introduce the rest of uh, our panelists as we uh, as they start talking. Go ahead, Nick. Thank you so much, Alumna. And uh, the kind of focus of my comments tonight um, are based on a conversation that I had with uh, Ruthie Gilmore. Um, and I was actually teaching a course, or I was invited by uh, my community back home, a group of Lakota people, to uh, teach a, a, a seminar or workshop on decolonization, which is a very broad subject. And, uh, I had just had a conversation with Ruthie and I wrote this kind of reflection um, for that presentation. And I, I think it, it, it really speaks to this moment in time uh, and what's going on in Palestine. And I get into a little bit. So I just wanna, I'll just begin with um, what I wrote and, and add uh, some, some thoughts about what's going on in the world right now. So the revolutionary, the African revolutionary Amilcar Cabral once asked his counterparts throughout the world, how did they wage successful armed struggle? The common strategy they responded was to wage a guerrilla war by taking the mountains. The most famous example of this is how Fidel and, and Che took the Sierra Miestras, learning the campesino culture and struggle while also waging an armed revolution against the US-backed Cuban dictator, Bautista. Cabral listened and studied the, his comrades' suggestions intensely. He, his West African nation of Guinea-Bissau is unique in its geography. It's flat with a coastal region and interior. There are no mountains. There are also distinct political, social, economic, and historical conditions that made his country different from the island nation of Cuba. As for our mountains, Cabral said, we decided that our people had to take their place since it would be impossible to develop our struggle otherwise. So our people are our mountains. They would struggle among the people, creating literacy programs and health clinics to meet uh, basic needs. It was from the common people that the PAIGC, Cabral's political party, drew its strength. They drew from the ranks the most militant anti-colonial peoples in Guinea-Bissau, the tribal people who lived in the forest. He called this a return to the source. That source was a distinct African culture that was, that was preserved primarily by those oppressed by Portuguese colonialism, not urban elites, but the villagers and the tribal people who lived in the forest. The power of the latter lay in their culture of resistance, which had held at bay complete domination by a foreign, foreign culture. Revolution for Cabral didn't mean becoming a European society or a European style state, but becoming a society that reflected its own culture and values. Yet more than cultural resistance was at stake. The source is what defines the historical nature of continued mi militant resistance that shapes certain struggles, but it is also of root uh, the root of what could bloom into beauty if allowed to grow properly. 
capitalism and imperialism have meld developed the continents of, of Africa and the Americas. Imagine what these vast continents could be had they not suffered the crimes they have. Imagine the knowledge, art, books, science, and technology, the beauty of humanity that was lost and destroyed. We cannot change the past, but we certainly live in a present entirely structured by our past. And for that, we are responsible. Cabral's ideas resonated with the red power movement of the 1960s. For example, a decade of militant struggle that began with the National Indian Youth Council under the leadership of Clyde Warrior quickly spread to urban and reservation Indian communities. American, the American Indian movement formed in Minneapolis, St. Paul in 1968. Uh, and the red power movement, however, was still looking for its mountains. What was its source of strength and power? Sure. It mobilized the, the frustrations of indigenous youth who had, be, who had become disillusioned by the failed policy of urban relocation and termination. Many had desired a return uh, to a culture that seemed alienated from them. It became clear with the Wundini occupation in 1973 that AIM increasingly sought guidance from traditional elders. And in 1974, it was the treaty people, the traditional elders, who became AIM's mountains. They were the source of knowledge and guidance. They said to take the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty to the United Nations and to charge the United States with genocide. Armed resistance during Red Power was never a, pri was never a primary strategy. In fact, it was always self-defense. American Indian resistance during this time posed zero military threat to the United States government. So why did the United States crack down so hard? We can ask the same question about the US war in Vietnam during the Red Power movement or we can ask the same question of, the, of Israel and the Palestinian uprising, the Intifada. Why Palestine? Why Vietnam? Vietnam, a poor country, posed no real threat, military threat to the United States. It was the so-called domino effect, the spread of communism that worried Washington. The David versus Goliath story uh, in Palestine. Peasants, you know, uh, common people, def uh, keeping at bay one of the most advanced military forces in history, an armed nuclear power would shake the very foundations of US hegemony in the region and throughout the world. So if Palestine could do it, if Vietnam could do it, who else? More starkly than any other group in the United States, indigenous movements exposed the fundamental contradictions of US democracy, as well as the nature of its historical development via theft of land, resources, and genocide. But unlike, or, but like the indigenous people, excuse me, um, So, un so unlike uh, other kind of struggles throughout the world, uh, indigenous people's armed struggle was for a brief moment in time, or not uh, in the, in the uh, excuse me, in the 20th century. Sorry, I'm reading off of my phone here and I just lost my track. Um, so in this current moment, this is, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that history and the connections that were made with other liberation struggles, because it's important to put into context that the Red Power Movement wasn't just uh, a domestic struggle. It wasn't just another civil rights movement. It was a global in nature. In many ways, the Black Freedom Movement itself in the, within the United States was also uh, international, but it often doesn't get read as such. So, um, you know, solidarity in, in this moment in time post uh, Wounded Knee uh, was an important component of the Red Power Movement that often goes ignored. Had the indigenous movement not gone to the international arena, uh, had they chosen to ally with the NATO countries, uh, you know, the, the North Atlantic powers, the traditional European colonizers, um, things would be much different. But instead, they would try to return to the source, not just within their own kind of traditions. They weren't just navel gazing, thinking about culture and spirituality, what it meant to indigenous people here. But they were thinking and looking at the commonality of struggle throughout the world. And for them, solidarity wasn't a fleeting moment. You know, the we have, uh, you know, Presently, the allied struggles uh, that have organized around the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, but more importantly, going beyond the sort of groundwork that's laid by the BDS movement, you know, advocating for uh, Palestine liberation. But there's a historical origin to this um, that often goes unremarked. Hold on, I'm going to close this window. Um, and that's the the you know the, the fact that like BDS was partially inspired by the South African uh, anti-apartheid movement um, that helped end apartheid, but also through uh, of course armed struggle. Um, indigenous people were also made a category 
at the at the United Nations during this particular moment in time. Uh, and this was during the UN decade to combat racism, racial discrimination, and apartheid, which began in 1974. And in that in that same kind of uh, meeting and, and organizing while they were combating uh, apartheid, Zionism was recognized as a form of racism, but also indigenous people got international recognition for the first time that term indigenous people came into existence. It wasn't just through you know, appealing to the liberal masters or the North Atlantic powers, it came through allying with third world decolonization movements and looking to the, you know, the struggles in the left and uh, the liberation movements happening throughout the world. Of course, we, we know that Zionism uh, as a form of racism was reversed or removed uh, after the 1993 Oslo Accords, uh, but nonetheless, this gave a platform to not only indigenous people, but also to Palestinian rights. Um, and you know, to kind of go beyond this, this sort of uh, this this connection at the at the United Nations, just through uh, legal recognition, uh, in 1977, the Treaty Council, you know, uh, gained uh, NGO status um, by calling for the end of the celebration of Columbus Day, and declared instead the International Day of Solidarity and Mourning with Indigenous Peoples. Um, the the UN Declaration, or excuse me, the UN Committee on Racism and Racial Apartheid, as I mentioned before, um, you know, uh, sponsored the event, but also so too did the Palestine Liberation Organization, uh, as well as the African National Congress, um, who all recognized the devastating legacies of European colonialism and African slavery um, had to be addressed, especially in the Americas. So in 1982, Spain and the Vatican proposed a 500 year commemoration of Columbus's voyage at the United Nations uh, General Assembly. Um, the entire African delegation in solidarity with indigenous peoples of the Americas um, walked out of the meeting and protesting celebrating uh, colonialism, the very system the UN was supposed to end. So the commemoration was crushed. Um, and the UN declared a celebration of the world's indigenous peoples day and a decade of world indigenous peoples, which began in 1994 uh, and, and has continued um, to this day. So without this lateral solidarity, you know, uh, we wouldn't have historic documents such as the 2007 uh, UN declaration on the rights of indigenous people. But more importantly, we wouldn't have the Palestinian contingent at Standing Rock that showed up as well as the Black Lives Matter contingent that showed up. They actually called the part of camp uh, the West Bank uh, in, in honor of um, what was happening, not only uh, to uh, indigenous people in, in uh, Standing Rock, but also what was happening in Palestine. The very tear gas canisters that were being fired at water protectors in Standing Rock were field tested against Palestinians uh, in the West Bank. Uh, and there were actually some online communications about how to best address uh, you know, uh, tear gas uh, uh, chemical assaults and things, uh, things of that nature. But more importantly in this moment in time, and I think there's a tendency uh, to look at indigenous people as victims of history, to look at indigenous movements as only oppressed and suppressed. But I think what Palestine shows us, and you know, the same goes with Palestine, to get the media narrative out there, we have to show the crimes of Israel, you know, the war crimes that are being committed and backed by the Biden administration and supported with US tax dollars. But more importantly, I think it's important to remember to return to that source and to remember who, what our mountains are, right? And when we think about decolonization and revolution and actually support the resistance and acknowledge that Palestine is more than, uh, more than tragedy, right? It is an alternative. It is an alternative political program. And I can say on Saturday when there were mass protests in solidarity with Palestine, all political tendencies came together under one flag and that was the Palestinian flag. And we haven't seen this kind of um, solidarity uh, you know, in such a long time, and it's it's because of the warriors, it's because of the freedom fighters um, that brought us out onto the street, right? It's not about tragedy, it's about revolution. So I'll end my my comments there. I look forward to hearing from the rest of you all. Thank you, Nick. Okay, so our next speaker is actually Sarah. Sarah Raimundo uh, is a faculty member at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and will be talking to us about working with the comrades in New York. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to uh, the organizers of Red May and uh, my fellow panelists. Um, 
I'm also from uh, the uh, Bayan, uh, Philippines, uh, and it's um, International Liaison Officer. Uh, Bayan is uh, the new Patriotic Alliance. It is uh, an alliance that is uh, based on the uh, Peasant Worker Alliance, uh, together with all the progressive forces here in the country, uh, fighting fascism and U.S. imperialism. Uh, I want to talk about a Filipino punk band based in New York City, whom I've met uh, when I was there. And by doing so, I will also be touching on the anti-imperialist and anti-fascist struggle of Bayan USA or the New Patriotic Alliance and uh, other allied organizations and uh, connect these with U.S. military largesse and U.S. coin or uh, U.S. counterinsurgency. So in a, in a post-gig get-together, uh, this was in 2018, uh, when audience and performers go back to uh, normal programming as friends and comrades, I asked Material Support's uh, Filipina front performer, uh, Jackie Mariano, who is a uh, punk performer by night, uh, but also a lawyer and an adjunct professor uh, by day at CUNY, I asked her about what she thinks happens when uh, production, performance, and distribution of music refuses uh, fetishistic uh, cultural enjoyment because that's what punk is all about, or at least that's how I'm approaching punk. And her answer was very simple. She says, what happens is uh, politics. So what is this mode of politics? Um, material supports music can be fully understood by its claim to the political and its main goal is to uh, create a, a critical audience attuned to the concrete conditions of anti-imperialist resistance in the Philippines, uh, conditions that uh, uh, made the formation of material support possible to begin with. Uh, material support, a New York City-based uh, you know, uh, as a as a New York City based punk band, um, and as typical punk bands go, uh, they challenge the pleasure bringing power of music intrinsic to um, you know mainstream music's definition that is supposed to bring imaginary universalism and the illusion of it being um, shared and uh, without an owner. But what does it mean to be uh, a political? punk band in, in NYC. Um, so for, for material support, this is none other than the rejection of um, their band's autonomy from uh, social determinations. Um, material support participates in a politics that exposes the uncertainty of uh, US politics marked by uh, the neoliberal ideology, which uh, proclaims the end of politics, no more class struggle, no more revolution. Um, it is effectively saying that uh, there is nothing to redistribute uh, when uh, in fact uh, productivity is uh, at its highest. Um, so of course this view can only be valid if one believes that uh, the world is limited to uh, Europe and uh, North America and the labors of peoples in the global south uh, as well as uh, the migrants uh, uh, in uh, the global north do not count for uh, human experience. Um, that people are, are massively incarcerated, uh, abused, brutalized by the police, rendered homeless with no access to health care and uh, proper nutrition um, in the global south. Uh, and that the same people are massively exported to different parts of the world as cheap and docile labor is also a sign of, of class struggle uh, with, of course, the 0.01% thriving precisely because of all that human misery. Uh, so this accounts for uh, the history and political economy that brought band members of material support um, uh, to each other and to the movement they serve. But what exactly is this movement? In a uh, discussion of uh, the national situation in the Philippines, uh, in also in the early 2018, Feb 2018, at the City of University New York International Committee, which uh, Manny Ness heads, 
uh, lead vocals, Jackie Mariano and comrades uh, shed light on the campaigns of the International Committee for Human Rights in the Philippines and uh, Bayan USA. Uh, so they were talking about the resumption of the peace talks and uh, the call to end the war on drugs. Uh, the martial law in Mindanao, uh, they were identified as the most pressing issues or tactical issues of the day. So these uh, tactical campaigns are geared towards drawing in the, the broadest number of supporters and activists to the strategic campaign for land redistribution and national industrialization in one of the United States semi-colonies, the Philippines. Uh, these objectives, as uh, Jackie's group highlights, do not make up a national agenda, but unites all Filipinos, uh, regardless of uh, social position. Um, so he, she also adds that, uh, you know, it also marks the divide between the forces of revolution and reaction. So uh, the statement is also a recognition of a fundamental antagonism in Philippine society. And this antagonism is demonstrated, but, but what, what they're calling a dual state power uh, defining the dynamics of crisis and resistance in the Philippines. And this is none other than the struggle between the government of the Republic of the Philippines, a puppet government of the United States, and the Communist Party of the Philippines, the New People's Army, and the National Democratic Front, or the CPP, NPA, and the F. Of course, uh, these two entities, the Philippine state and the CPP, NPA, and the F, do not wield the same amount of power at this point. Uh, the CPP and NDF is an oppositional force that does not necessarily represent all opposition forces in the Philippines. Uh, for example, uh, the National Democratic Front banners the organized party along uh, Marxist, Leninist, Maoist principles. And uh, the persistence of this underground political entity and uh, the parallel legal urban mass movement challenge the abdication of revolutionary armed struggle. Uh, from the NDF, we learned that the Philippine state is not heterogeneous, but is fully uh, gripped by a um, a cabal of U.S. military industrial interests, and uh, it is therefore armed to the teeth against the people. Uh, there's no such thing as peace time since the U.S. turned the Philippines into a semi-colony. So. In the social antagonism, we see the simultaneous persistence of uh, structural stasis and uh, destabilization um, or destabilizing changes. Uh, and this is none other than the class struggle. Yet uh, the, material, the materiality of, of class struggle is muddled and marginalized in, in various fields. Uh, in the culture industry, music is associated with its very own um, imaginary universalisms and the illusion of it being, you know, as I said earlier, shared without an owner. And the practice of sharing in this context is really just reduced to consumption of mass produced goods. And um, the, the absence of an owner refers to the normalization and naturalization of dominant class interests. So this sort of collectivity merely refers to a collectivization of uh, some kind of shared experience or uh, shared meaning in relation to a global consensus under under capitalism and an imperialist system. Uh, and this, this is the neoliberal consensus that currently reconciles itself with neo-fascist regimes through the abdication of uh, the political or, or the class struggle, which in practical terms simply means the denial of uh, the possibility of redistribution in our age. So in this sense, uh, material support intervenes into and challenges the neoliberal claims to the end of class struggle. Uh, this affirmation takes into concrete takes into uh, the concrete struggles of uh, the national liberation movements or national struggles, uh, especially here in the Philippines. And what I want to emphasize here is that the presence of groups like Material Support and Bayan USA and other allied organizations in in the belly of the beast uh, does not merely fill in the lack of anti-imperialist politics from within an imperialist superpower. I have serious reservations about what good people in the US criticize as the tendency of uh, dominant US left politics to be just focused on the interest of the people of the United States. Um, that sounds to me like uh, the criticism is only good at 
you know, uh, they're only good at waging class struggle, like the dominant U.S. left within the U.S., despite the fact that the same is pretty much shaped by uh, the U.S. position as a global imperialist power. Uh, but Marx um, issued a fair warning on this. Uh, uh, those who cannot understand how one nation can grow rich at the expense of another were uh, even less uh, well equipped to understand how in the same country one class can enrich itself at the expense of another. So um, from, uh, from being of uh, really minute relevance to the standpoint of uh, class struggle, the exploitation and oppression that obtained from um, an imperialist system uh, is actually a condition in terms of organizing um, a, an understanding of social conflict and class struggle at a national level. So no imperialist politics, no class politics also. You can't even be good at class politics domestically while rejecting the anti-imperialist struggle. These two are intertwined. And uh, let me just uh, talk about U.S. military uh, largesse at this point, which largely uh, contains um, class politics or, you know, the organizing of a mass movement uh, for uh, national industrialization and land redistribution. Earlier this year, President Duterte demanded more U.S. military aid in exchange for extending a key security pact with Washington. And this is none other than the VFA or the Visiting Forces Agreement of 1998, which allows uh, the legal entry of huge numbers of U.S. forces for joint combat training with uh, Filipino troops. Uh, the alliance between the U.S. and the Philippines is the longest and the most crucial anchor for U.S. hegemony in Southeast Asia. And the region, Southeast Asia, is central to the emerging U.S.-China competition and the new Cold War that the U.S. pursues to advance its national interests amidst um, uh, deep economic crisis. Uh, the VFA and EDCA, Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, negotiated between former presidents Noenoy Aquino and Barack Obama, are vital to the U.S. war on terror, implemented through both combat and civil military operations, such as disaster relief operations. Um, it is estimated that for the Battle of Marawi, uh, which started in May 2017, uh, for the Battle of Marawi alone, the U.S. delivered military equipment to the Duterte government amounting to $36 million. In December 2020, uh, Trump gifted Duterte a $29 million worth of defense equipment. Amidst uh, COVID-19 menace, defense secretaries of uh, this uh, unequal core periphery alliance called the delivery uh, an unexpected gift and a symbol of the warm alliance between the U.S. and the Philippines. Um, and the, in a recent OPED, uh, Philippine ambassador to the U.S., Jose Manuel Romualdez, states that for the same alliance to thrive, the U.S. must equip the Philippines with uh, new aircraft and other hard assets. And of course, this statement immediately follows an earlier revelation on Duterte's plan to purchase a, uh, you know, to purchase uh, Black Hawk helicopters manufactured by uh, PZL Milek. It's a Polish subsidiary of the U.S. defense firm Lockheed Martin. Um, this, as the report states, will allow the Philippine Air Force to retire its aging fleet, uh, the Bell uh, Bell U UE helicopters. So in April 2020, uh, Bayan and its allied organizations in the U.S. exposed and opposed the notification received by the U.S. Congress from the U.S. State Department of potential sales of attack helicopters and missiles to the Philippines worth a combined uh, $2 billion. While Washington refuses to be transparent on specific U.S. arms sales, uh, U.S. Defense, uh, U.S. Secretary of Defense um, Lloyd Austin affirmed U.S. commitment to Philippine military support in a phone call between himself and his Philippine counterpart, uh, General Delphine Lorenzana. And this commitment signals none, or, none other than the use of tax dollars to fund death squads and human rights violators from within the Duterte's government. Um, in the history of modern states, and I want to talk about uh, 
U.S. counterinsurgency, any alliance between an imperialist power like the U.S. and a client state like the Philippines can only be a partnership that uses terrorism as a pretext to carry out endless wars of aggression against the people. Uh, the hostilities experienced by the critics of the tyrannical Duterte regime, incarceration of dissenters, uh, killings of activists, and the fake drug war are instances of state terrorism perpetuated to maintain U.S. global hegemony. Uh, the U.S. imperialist state and Duterte's puppet state are fully consolidated and united in increasing capacity building for so-called military modernization program, which is none other than the implementation of U.S. coin or U.S. counterinsurgency. It's a comprehensive campaign of uh, violent suppression against forces regarded as threats to U.S. hegemony, as we all know. Um, it has been brutally impo uh, imposed by the U.S. upon its hijack of the 1896 revolution, anti-colonial revolution against, uh, against Spain, and the ruthless destruction of all forms of anti-imperialist defiance. It must be stressed that in the Philippines, this led to the genocide of whole populations. Uh, during the Phil-American War, uh, there were one million Filipinos who were killed when the population uh, back then was just a little over 2 million. So cultivating the so-called U.S.-Philippine alliance is one of the top priorities of President Joe Biden on account of his determination to thwart Chinese expansionism in uh, the Asia Pacific. However, the campaign for human rights and to stop the killings in the Philippines pushed by U.S.-based organizations exposed the appalling human rights record of the armed forces of the Philippines, which includes the extrajudicial killings of environmental and land rights activists. And as a result, a pending bill in the U.S. House of Representatives that halts all security aid to the Philippines was proposed last year by members of uh, Biden's Democratic Party. Yet, genuine progressives in the West and uh, national liberation activists worldwide know that U.S. coin is a bipartisan approach to ensure U.S. economic, political, and uh, military dominance worldwide. Uh, Duterte's National Task Force uh, to End Local Communist Armed Conflict, or what they call the ntf uh, was created by uh, his executive order, in December 2018, this is EO-70. It is an intervention made by the security sector, uh, the armed forces of the Philippines, a most reliable and loyal armed force to the U.S. State Department. So two key interventions took place. First, the security sector's instruction to cancel the peace talks between the government of the Republic of the Philippines and the National Democratic Front of the Philippines for a lack of transparency on the part of the Duterte government. Second, Duterte cancels the peace talks and puts up the national task force to end local uh, communist, uh, you know, counterinsurgency with himself as task force chair. Uh, and in the recent budget deliberations in Congress, Duterte lackeys fought tooth and nail for uh, a budget for this entity of at least 16 billion pesos. So for four years, we have been we've been witnessing the worst human rights violations, a transfer of wealth to the new Duterte loyalist elites, massive land grabs and full scale militarization of urban and rural communities and the situation. How, you know, the situation, however, however, is not new to us. Uh, Marcus Martial Law, which the Filipino defeated in a long struggle that ousted uh, the dictator in 1986, was a period of uh, atrocious attacks on the Filipino people, uh, side by side, dramatic increase in military and economic aid from the United States. And so the Filipino people's resolve to defend national sovereignty and assert our democratic will against the U.S. Duterte regime is labeled a terrorist act. We have been uh, paying a high price for our struggle, no less than our comrades' freedoms and lives. As the U.S. imperialist state used tax dollars for drones, missiles, guns, uh, surveillance aircraft, and other artillery that turns the Philippine landscape into um, killing fields. Uh, so. We, uh, we, we call on uh, peace and, and freedom-loving Filipinos uh, and peoples worldwide to support our initiative to exert pressure on the U.S. Duterte regime to stop the killings and desist from committing human rights violations against the people uh, through uh, different um, organizations, uh, even uh, United Nations Commission on Human Rights, and hold uh, U.S. Duterte regime accountable for all its atrocities in an international uh, people's tribunal. 
um, the stakes. So let me just end with uh, you know the stakes of uh, material support and all organized migrant Filipino groups in the U.S., such as Bayan USA, Migrante USA, and other anti-imperialist, anti-fascist migrant Filipinos appreciative of the National Democratic Revolution towards socialism in the Philippines. Uh, this resistance is a uh, collective demand for the economic emancipation of migrant Filipino workers and their allied classes in the home front and the liberation of the Philippines as an oppressed nation by um, imperialism and as an anti-imperialist mass movement in the Philippines and different parts of the world where there are Filipino migrant workers, uh, we in Bayan will persevere in the struggle to end the U.S. Duterte fascist regime and lift up uh, the struggles of uh, peoples for uh, national sovereignty, uh, self-determination, and just peace anywhere in the world. Um, and the ongoing Nakba and Free Palestine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, okay, so our next speaker is Emmanuel Ness. Um, he is a professor of political science at Brooklyn College, City University of New York, and Senior Research Associate, Center for Social Change, University of Johannesburg. He is author of Southern Insurgency, as well as Guest Workers and Resistance to U.S. Corporate Despotism. Uh, his work is focused on migration, labor movements, and political organizations, social change, and imperialism. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Lubna, and thank you, uh, Red May, for um, inviting me to speak, and uh, also to uh, my colleagues here who are, um, you know, I'm very uh, interested in uh, the presentations that I've heard so far. They were very stimulating and thought provoking. And um, uh, so I, I will, you know, briefly make a few comments. Uh, I, I was thinking about what to um, talk about. Um, and uh, there, there, there's this chapter in a book I just wrote, which is, you did mention, uh, Organizing Insurgency. That uh, I did not write, that I did not publish as part of the book, and uh, that chapter, in some respects, uh, is crucial because uh, it reflects um, the uh, divided loyalties uh, amongst the working class on a global basis, and um, I can uh, reveal this uh, through uh, a number of uh, empirical um, and. Uh, quantitative uh, evidence that uh, has, uh, uh, you know, may have accumulated over the years. Um, you know, so I, I would start with the concept of the uh, aristocracy of labor, which is um, uh, a, you know, when we take a look at the form of imperialism that the uh, British had uh, engaged in during the, uh, the 19th century, uh, much of it was against uh, the Irish people, uh, and then that extended throughout uh, the global south, uh, in which uh, anyone who was uh, not uh, British was considered um, second class. Uh, the, the Irish people, for instance, in the cities of Manchester, London, Liverpool, major uh, industrial areas uh, were, were primarily Irish. Uh, there were some people from rural areas as well, as um, Raymond William tells us but uh, Irish dominated the, the cities and uh, they were treated as subordinates uh, to a, a great degree. Uh, and so when we look at the earliest uh, period of capitalism, uh, the, the working class was in some respects drawn from um, a form of imperialism that was uh, extracted in, 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 from, from, um, from Ireland. And so what I, um, Pointing out is that in the, the the point would be that um, uh, May is a, a period of time that we're we're celebrating the working class, and uh, that's that's a wonderful thing. I, I think that we we need to have a sense of uh, uh, what working class, uh, which working class, and uh, uh, is it possible for working classes uh, working classes in the global north, in the imperialist north, uh, to uh, ally with working classes uh, throughout the world who are far uh, more uh, exploited and uh, every day go through uh, struggles. So I wanted just to, you know, one 
one bit of empirical uh, and quantitative, in this case, quantitative evidence would be from the Democratic Socialists of America, which I am not a member of and I would not be a member of because of their political perspective. And, and, the, and you know, one of, um, when they were forming two, three years ago, I remember I was in, I think, Hong, yeah, I know Hong Kong, and I was giving a paper about uh, the DSA and uh, people were trying to um, talk about the emergence of a kind of populism in the United States. And uh, in my view, uh, in the spring of 2018, uh, that populism was one uh, of left-right populism, but even the left populism was one that saw, you know, issues such as uh, increasing wages, uh, which I guess people all want, uh, improving, uh, you know, people's housing, uh, increasing uh, education, et cetera, which are laudable goals and so forth. Uh, as being uh, very important. You know, we could all say that that's, yeah, that's something that we, we care about. Uh, yet at the same time, when it came to uh, US foreign interventions on a global scale that, you know, it, it barely, you know, maybe 2% of all the uh, people uh, who were polled who were uh, DSA members considered that to be an urgent uh, issue. And so um, I think that really is very telling in terms of the uh, so-called US left um, uh, and how we need to um, start thinking about uh, constructing uh, a, a left that is uh, more durable and has an organizational basis that uh, focuses on uh, the tremendous amount of global inequity that exists, is, exists between the, what I will call the first world and the third world, which of course I didn't call it that, but uh, I prefer to use that terminology. And, um, and so I, I would argue that the US left in many ways is part of the problem. Uh, and that uh, if we take a look at most of their struggles that they've uh, imparted upon, uh, they're about uh, improving the conditions of the European working class. Yes, of course, neoliberalism has been a very important uh, factor uh, in uh, eroding wages and living standards and so forth. But at the same time, if we take a look at GDP per capita, uh, it's continued to increase as uh, GDP per capita in the global south has increased at a far lower, uh, in the third world, at a far lo lower uh, pace. Um, and so uh, for me, the idea of a red May would be the idea of, well, you know, here we are, you know, liberation. Uh, the idea, yes, Nakba, but also there was a liberation that took place in 1945 uh, in which uh, the communists defeated the fascists. And uh, I, I see that as a very significant moment in, in history, uh, one of you know, the maybe three or four most significant uh, moments in history, the, you know, including tragedies that have taken place. But this was a victory for uh, the forces uh, that uh, you know, were opposed to uh, fascism and uh, it was a united front, yes, and so forth. Uh, and it led to um, uh, kind of a proliferation of movements throughout the global South. Uh, the idea that, you know, is often um, referred to in the literature, you know, Prabhat Patnaik's work uh, deals with this question to some uh, great extent, uh, that there was this kind of uh, elation that people had in the 1940s that, yes, we also will get our independence. Yes, we will also be free. And so, you know, we, we then see, you know, the, the Chinese national independence and liberation movements uh, followed by um, uh, Korean and uh, many others throughout the world. Uh, those were struggles in which many people died at the hands, the brutal hands of the Americans. And again, people who uh, were living relatively peacefully, I, I, I should say, of course, there was the Japanese occupation of uh, Korea and Manchuria. Uh, uh, and so it wasn't so peaceful, but it was a defeat of uh, the Japanese and uh, I, the Western nations, uh, including Japan, but especially the Western nations did not necessarily take a position on, uh, on fascism uh, in the 1930s. And 40s, one can actually um, I remember a 1940 New York Times front page article with Truman as center, senator saying, 
let, let them just both fight it out and kill each other, and then we can rule the world. And in some respects, uh, uh, that has come to fruition, uh, uh, although uh, I, I, I'm making the very strong case that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, we, we can't say um, decimation, we have to say the destruction of the indigenous people uh, in uh, the Americas is uh, one of the great uh, tragedies of humankind uh, the, the, in the modern era, the period of slavery that uh, followed, uh, as well as fascism, uh, they all combine. And we see, uh, you know, upon thinking about it, we see these trends uh, and patterns continuing till this day, uh, you know, this very day, as uh, we see uh, what is going on in um, occupied Palestine. So I, um, I, I want to, to say uh, that uh, I am a pragmatist. That may sound very odd, uh, but I, I believe in what is possible, what we can actually do in moving forward rather than what is not possible. And uh, I also th believe in taking risks, calculated risks that are uh, uh, quite uh, uh, important in terms of uh, advancing uh, the movements and so forth. Um, uh, at this point in time, uh, we are living in a world that is probably the most unequal uh, in, in its history, where the planet itself is uh, on the verge of eco ecological collapse, uh, where we cannot even see each other except through uh, a screen and so forth. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, we got here to a great degree as a consequence of U.S. policies that have been and, and, and European or Euro-American, if I could put it that way, policies that have been applied on a global level. You know, I, I don't have to go through the litany, I, I could, uh, but the litany of examples of Europeans and Americans invading countries throughout the world. There is no shortage of, of them. There's, you know, hundreds of examples and they're continuing today uh, in which, you know, uh, we, we must uh, find uh, some, you know, some way to, to resist. Uh, I was very pleased, uh, you know, to see that there is uh, a, a very strong uh, movement in the Philippines that is uh, uh, has possibilities to to uh, achieve a form of liberation, uh, and so that's why I say pursue what is possible or probably possible. You know, since the dissolution of the USSR, uh, of course, uh, things this pro process of neoliberalism began, and, and it uh, contributed to. Uh, um, a great decline in uh, standards of living. Of course, I would say that the USSR was in decline since the 1950s, uh, and that uh, that's another for a question for another day, uh, and so forth. And that uh, there there were very important very important roads for uh, uh, advancing uh, political struggle uh, that. Uh, came to an end uh, with the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, we saw the end of apartheid, yes, in South Africa, there was no question about it, but uh, at what expense did that end take uh, uh, place? The end of apartheid actually reinforced the power of the white ruling class in South Africa to an even greater extent, and it legitimated um, uh, what I would say de facto apartheid that continues to exist to this day. So we should be careful for what we hope for. Uh, if we are going to achieve some form of economic justice for, you know, real working class people who uh, uh, the vast majority live outside of Europe and the United States and North America, um, we have to uh, really engage in a deep discussion about the uh, redistribution of wealth that uh, is um, a uh, absolute necessity for uh, changing the world system. Um, so what kind of future of socialism is possible? Uh, I would say that, you know, we, we should look at the past examples of socialism. And uh, in some, you know, and that, that gives me some sense of uh, hope and optimism uh, that uh, we're seeing the continuation of struggles going on throughout the world, as was described by my two uh, predecessors in this uh, conversation, uh, that people are fighting back and uh, engaging in struggle on a um, 
very uh, uh, you know systematic basis. Uh, it is my view that people actually do engage in struggle all the time. Um, uh, you know, the term resistance is something that we often use. Uh, you know, resistance could be just one person deciding to uh, slouch off on the job. Uh, resistance could be of many different types. It could be individual. It doesn't have to be even part of a group. It could also be a working class movement. It could be a movement of oppressed people uh, who have uh, been the subjects of uh, colonialism and imperialism and so forth. Um, but those movements will never cohere unless uh, they are organized in some way. And that, that is uh, something that I feel, um, I think we all should be all recognize. But in the last 20, 30 years, uh, it even say 20 years, let's say, uh, there has been a, a kind of uh, shift in the way the, the left has been thinking uh, uh, that it has been somewhat a distortion, uh, a, a way of looking at politics as a um, open system that includes all peoples of the world, that we're all equal, we're all the same, we're all different, uh, and that we're one big happy family, all we have to do is get rid of capitalism. And that there is absolutely no discussion of organization. Uh, so, you know, some of the the words that we we heard from you know we read uh, from Hart and Negri and their acolytes uh, uh, you know are uh, you know I think very prescient the notion of autonomism uh, which I find uh, uh, a nice idea but it will get you nowhere very quickly because uh, uh, autonomism essentially uh, kind of conveys the notion that um, and I'm talking about a different form of autonomism that. Uh, you know, groups can exist and remain weak uh, as long as they're on their own and uh, they have their um, independence from uh, uh, a, a you know, different form uh, of power in some respects. Um, and, and this goes back actually to uh, my appreciation for some of the classical literature, which um, I think has been uh, diminished over the last uh, since it was written actually, uh, that you know, I think it's crucial to understand that um, spont spontaneity is something, it's a nice thing, it happens all the time, uh, and that uh, the academic uh, world out there uh, is, you know, praises it on a, such a regular basis that um, it uh, really reveals uh, their, the political interests of uh, the dominant, um, not, not only the dominant culture, but the dominant uh, academic world and so forth. Uh, and in this way, I, I'll say that uh, we get nowhere or you get nowhere because I, I, I'm a person of the global north, I think. And I, uh, I, I will say this, and even people in the global north should appreciate this, that you get nowhere without an organization. But we have had so many movements uh, that have taken place over the course of the last 10, 15 years, uh, they've gotten nowhere. And uh, this is why I particularly appreciate the um, comments that were made by Sarah Raimundo in terms of the or organization building that is so crucial uh, in developing um, uh, a transformative kind of uh, thinking. Um, I hope uh, this is uh, you know, very clear uh, in the sense um, that uh, we have a past of socialism that existed. Uh, it was in no way perfect, it was imperfect. Um, and um, I would argue very strongly that we have a future of socialism. And uh, I will make some perhaps controversial statements uh, in my closing remarks. That future of uh, socialism includes a socialism that may be socialism in one country, hopefully a very big country and so forth. Uh, hopefully the entire world, but it will not be a, a socialism that is built on the shoals of uh, very on weakness. So if we are going to uh, build, I mean, I, I guess there is a pessimism in my mind uh, with respect to the Palestinian people uh, who have been ignored for uh, decades, uh, if not over a century. Uh, there, there, need, there needs to be some kind of unity and there needs to be powerful organizations to resist the kinds of 
powerful organizations that already exist. Um, I, I think it, you know, I mean, I, this goes to a Leninist perspective in some respects. Um, I, Lenin writes in some of his works, uh, uh, his latest works uh, that he wrote uh, after uh, the revolution took place. He's, he argues that, you know, we have, and Mao also uh, follows these uh, perspectives, that, uh, you know, we have a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie that exists today. And that dictatorship will, um, uh, you know, continue to fight for power and to, and it has power. Uh, uh, and that is why we have to uh, build a dictatorship of the proletarians. And that proletarian dictatorship will be a dictatorship. It's not going to be uh, heaven on earth. It, we have to fight back because uh, this notion of uh, bourgeois capitalism will always be there. We have to fight it on an ideological and practical level. Uh, and uh, we, we have to build uh, parties and organizations that are durable. And um, so therefore I do point out the significance of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, and the final comments, uh, the importance of a vanguard uh, that is crucial uh, to uh, for people who are extremely disciplined and reliable, uh, but that cannot be achieved without a, a very um, uh, profound anti-imperialism and uh, you know uh, democratic centralism. Uh, I had a few more comments, but I think I was told to end it. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I look forward to a dialogue if possible. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, so our next speaker is Gabriel Kutipa Zorn uh, from New York. He is a New York City based educator, cultural worker, and writer. He is a PhD candidate in American studies at Yale University. His research engages histories of surveillance and agribusiness through the 20th century. His artwork has included a mural. The revolution starts in the earth, which um, which shows plants, which shows how plants offer a way to build connections between immigrant rights and Palestinian solidarity movements. Thank you so much. Um, I first want to just begin by saying that I'm speaking to you from Lenape Hoking, the traditional home of the Lenape people and that that was actually a crossroads of indigenous trade routes that existed for hundreds of years uh, before invaders from the backwater of the world came through. Uh, so the Lenape continued to survive today and recently held one of the largest gatherings in Manahata, uh, our growing black corn again, and whose continued resistance against settler erasure um, and spitting out premature tales of defeat inspires me a Quechua person from what is in present day Peru. Uh, and the point again, as Nick had mentioned earlier, is not to just acknowledge it, but to be part of efforts to give land back. Uh, so I wanted to thank the organizers of uh, Red May for all of their seen and unseen labor. And thank you uh, also for uh, being, for all the work of my panelists um, who I'm honored to be here talking with. Um, so I was just, uh, supposed to talk about Israel and the United States counter-revolutionary relationship with Latin America. And this is a relationship that stretches back as far as the founding of Israel um, and the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948, when Guatemala was one of the first countries to vote to recognize the imperial Israeli state. Uh, but first I wanna just acknowledge that it's, I mean, it's hard to just be on a panel when over, Every single hour, we don't know how many more people are being murdered in Gaza. So I just want to begin by saying solidarity with Palestinians in Gaza, the West Bank, Jerusalem, 48, and all across the diaspora. Um, yesterday, what was evident is that the Nakba um, has never stopped. And that's true because I cannot speak with a single Palestinian refugee um, who does not talk about and yearn for home in one shape or form or another. So... Gaza is burning and all the while the United States is sending messages to Israel where they say that my expectation and hope is that this will be closing down sooner than later in what writer uh, and farmer Linda Kikivish calls that like funny English that lawyers, cartel bosses and anyone paranoid about having to ever go on the record um, and listen to themselves later would ever use. Uh, so maybe what the United States cares about 
is Israel demonstrating its role as a civilizational outpost, a civilization that of course is barbarism and is full of war crimes. Um, and Israel needs to, uh, the United States needs Israel to demonstrate that swiftly to build greater uh, investor confidence, confidence worldwide through this counterinsurgent international as if Israel is on display at another world's fair uh, where all these new weapon systems are consistently for sale because the economic stability of these companies for shareholders is impossible without the promise of future imperial warfare. And we've seen this through Israel's military companies, Elbit Systems, their stock surging upon the promise to make billions for future investments in tanks, drones, and guns that other governments in India, Colombia, Brazil, the Philippines, Bahrain, and Azerbaijan are all clamoring for to buy for their own ends. And and this is, of course, you know, we know that these military companies are nationalists only when it's useful for them. Uh, but one of the ways I feel like that we talk about on the left about Israel's global role in a counterinsurgent international is primarily through these military alliances, through their, uh, through their shared efforts with border security walls or the deadly police exchange programs that brings uh, local U.S. Um, police officers to Israel um, that have been sponsored by organizations like JINSA and APAC, and that groups like Demilitarize the US of Palestine and JVP's deadly exchange campaigns have all been launched against. Um, and in these cases, it is focusing on these freelance imperialists who travel throughout um, the world to support empire regardless of borders, that's important. But what I kind of want to focus on is not just the military. Um, we can see that the military is one part of what the Zapatistas would call, refer to capitalism as the many headed Hydra, which is like a beast where there are many heads and any can grow back. But the military is one of the most obvious, but it's not the only one. Um, and this is kind of like what also Eduardo Bogaliano gets at a lot when he's saying that sub imperialism has a thousand faces. So whether we call it a head or a face, um, I want to focus. Uh, in my comments on the role of agriculture, um, specifically the role that Israel's agribusiness industries play, not just in the colonization of Palestine, but also towards a strengthening of global right-wing alliances. And when we talk about global right-wing alliances, I'm not just referring to white and rich people. Uh, it also includes brown, black, and poor people through class collaboration on the condition that they agree to support empire. And I think it's important that we focus on agriculture for two reasons. The first is that if we're talking about racial capitalism, if we're talking about global capitalism, it is a capitalism that was forged through land theft, through agriculture enclosure, um, dispossession, chattel slavery, and on the plantation. Um, and the second reason that's important to focus on agriculture is that in 2018, when Trump announced that he was going to unilaterally move the US embassy um, to Jerusalem, Netanyahu in response named agricultural exports to Africa, Asia, sorry, there's the sounds of Brooklyn. Um, uh, Netanyahu named agricultural exports to Africa, Asia, and Latin America as his primary method to defeat the global BDS movement. Uh, and again, when we talk about the global BDS movement, I think it's important to mention, as folks had mentioned before, that it is one tactic within a global solidarity movement for Palestine. It is not the totality of, uh, of, of solidarity mo uh, movements akin to the way that the Sullivan principles were only a part of the global movement to support African liberation uh, movements in Southern Africa. Uh, and so this campaign that Netanyahu was talking about was a campaign uh, to bring the native bourgeoisie from countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean to Israel for agribusiness exchange programs, which was an eerie kind of reminder of a similar occurrence that happened in the immediate aftermath of the Suez Canal crisis in 1957 when Israel invaded uh, the Suez Canal. Immediately afterwards, Israel recruited uh, leaders from recently decolonized countries like Tanzania, Ghana, and Cuba to aid 
in a campaign to name itself anti-colonial in the immediate aftermath of the invasion. Um, and so we can see how these global counterinsurgency efforts are just very disrespectful to the borders that empire creates. Um, and so it's important that we on the left um, need a uh, understanding of struggle where our understandings of freedom and justice don't just end at our own border, um, which are borders that in the words of South African uh, poet and anti-apartheid activist Willy Kigosili arrogantly defines where one piece of European property ends and another begins. Um, so I want to tell the story of Israel's role in agriculture through pine trees, olive trees, and coffee. Um, Netafim is one of the largest Israeli agricultural companies, and it's currently specializing in something that's called drone precision agriculture. Now, drone precision agriculture is important because it is one of the fastest um, growing industries within agribusiness. It is a, a, the effort to use drones to spray fertilizer on farmland. Um, and so Netafim has been at the forefront of this, namely thanks to their collaboration with Emprest, which is an Israeli military company that has been doing the targeting systems on drones and aircraft carriers um, and have been very present in the aerial bom uh, bombings, war crimes and all out war being waged in Gaza now and, be and were being waged in 2014. So when Netafim is spraying fertilizer on Israeli settlements on the hilltops of the West Bank, uh, the wastewater drains down to Palestinian villages below, often poisoning Palestinian land. Uh, Netafim and Elbet Systems have also sold dozens of drones to Bolsonaro in Brazil to spray fertilizer on cattle land that seeks to replace the Amazonian, Am Amazon areas that used to survive as temporary protected zones under Lula. And I'm also not saying here that like Lula is perfect as activists in Haiti have pointed out the Brazilian military's horrendous war crimes and sexual violence as part of the UN um, in the, af the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake. Um, nonetheless, Israel, uh, part of this effort to, between Israel and Brazil is also fed through another Israeli company, uh, a biotech company called Future Gene, which has been promising to speed up the growth of trees in both Palestine and Brazil. Um, in Palestine, this is to speed up pine trees, which are um, used to replace, thanks to the Jewish National Fund, um, olive trees, and pine trees are designated as state land, therefore is easily able to be seized under, um, under, under, under legal law, under law. Um, and in Brazil, they're being used alongside paper and pulp corporations like Susano, which are being given the green light uh, by Bolsonaro to raise the Amazon. And this is important because this was happening at the exact time when there was a conversation about um, the Brazilian embassy being moved as well to Jerusalem in a quid pro quo. Um, and so Netafim, while recent, also has been present prior to the last five years. It was present internationally in Guatemala in the 1980s under the genocidal dictatorship of Efrain Rios Montt. There, it used the language of rural development in the Green Revolution to work with Israeli agricultural advisors, the USAID and Guatemalan military officials to create model villages in Guatemala. And model villages are, sim are similar to reservations or agrovilles in Algeria. And they were plantation styled uh, villages where all people in rural areas were forced to leave their homes and be put onto smaller areas where their food consumption is highly controlled and um, folks are forced to uh, monocrop coffee for global capitalist uh, consumption. And these model villages have played a central role um, in counterinsurgency strategies throughout the world to militarize the land. So I think, you know, what does this mean? Clearly, we're seeing a way in which the ag agribusiness relationships are providing um, basically something that is useful 
for many of these uh, countries that are part of this counterinsurgent international. Um, so I think it's important to think of when Israel making, is making moves with other allied governments from Brazil, Guatemala, Nicaragua, India, um, part of the agreement is to think about how they can be useful to each other. And when we see Israel building an alliance with say Viktor Orban in, uh, in Hungary, a virulent anti-Semite and um, we can see that Israel's alliances with anti-Semitic governments is a method for those governments to avoid charges of actual anti-Semitism within their countries. Anti-Semitism and anti-communism have long played in the hands of uh, the playbook of fascists. Uh, Israel's alliance with South Africa in the 1950s flourished while Jewish South African communists like Ruth First were being silenced and disappeared. Um, Israel's military alliance with Argentina in the dirty wars of the 1980s continued while the Argentine government was harboring former Nazis. Um, and meanwhile, if we even just think of Europe, Europe is able to name itself a defender of Jewish people, uh, which is a trash statement given their expulsion of Jews in 1492 um, and going back even to 1290 with the expulsion of Jews from, uh, from England itself, right? So I think it's important to be that making yourself useful is a philosophy of survival for what we could call yesterday's wretched of the earth and those who are oppressed but yearn to be oppressors. Um, and here I'm referring to Israel, but not just Israel. I think there are in all of the world, all the world's peoples, there are people who today wish they too could become um, oppressors, right? Um, and I say that, and I think that's really important because when I talk about Israel's global reach, I'm not trying to say that they're, that they're reaching everywhere because I think there's a very dangerous way in which a discussion of that can lead into anti tropes of anti-Semitism. And those tropes of anti-Semitism um, are actually ways to not discuss global capitalism, right? Because um, having a conversation about Israel having a global role um, is actually a way to avoid the fact that Israel is one country in a, in a global capitalist system, and it is not unique in that sense. Right, um, it is part of a worldwide imperialism and capitalism, and so focusing, I think, on agriculture is really important because um, we need to think about how we're reshaping BDS uh, global tactics. A lot of BDS campaigns focus still on military companies in the United States, and I think it's crucial that we think about. Um, if white supremacy is a fast moving technology in which they're um, using agriculture now, we have we on the left have to adapt just as quickly in order to um, in order to demonstrate and in order to stop these global flows of capital, um, which are what racial capitalism is. It is a circulatory system of veins and arteries of blood that must continue to flow. And BDS's goal is to almost create a blood clot to show that uh, capital has to ossify and calcify until it's no longer profitable. That's what boycotts are able to congeal capital to the reality of, of its relationship with, um, with blood, that it comes into the world as uh, um, you know, um, as part of blood, right? Which is what Marx talks about. And so, I think the stakes here of being able to understand white supremacy as a rapidly moving technology and reshaping our struggle is about how we're going to eat in the future. Because if we think about folks trying to ha have farmland, trying to be able to eat in, um, outside of a global capitalist system, if those farmlands are being surveilled by companies that have intense surveillance capability, um, to what degree is, or to what extent does that allow the spaces that we try to craft as outside of, the global, of global capitalism to actually be able to be free? Um, obviously, surveillance capitalism is not the answer to climate change. 
And instead, I would say like focusing on exchanges between indigenous peoples um, from Palestine, seed exchanges uh, offers a very important alternative to the one posed that technology will save us when we have clearly seen that it is part of and it shapes this hydra that we speak of. Okay, thank you, Gabrielle. Um, so we, I, th I think we're, thank you so much for all these talks. Um, they were very enlightening. Um, I think we are uh, opening up questions for the audience who are watching through YouTube and Facebook. So if anybody has any questions, um, please send your questions uh, through um, Facebook chat or um, YouTube. Uh, comments. Um, before we um, take the audience's questions, and uh, I was wondering if the panelists would like to take the opportunity first to sort of respond to each other or um, ask questions to each other. Um, I also have some questions and there are, we already have plenty of questions from the audience too. So. Okay, um, so let's see. Um, I have a sort of uh, a first question um, and I sort of hate to start us off this way, but um, I wanna talk about challenges and tensions in uh, global solidarity movement. Um, and I think um, especially um, you, Emmanuel and Sarah, you, you sort of um, um, touched on this uh, a bit in your talks. Um, so I think like before um, moving here, um, I was an activist in the anti-occupation movement in Palestine. And um, I think that in, while I was in Palestine, I didn't think much about um, how, like uh, how to create a movement, a strong movement and the foundations of a strong uh, international solidarity movement. But um, when I moved to the US, I started thinking more about um, about the foundations of a movement, especially when I started noticing some of the cracks that weren't visible to me in Palestine as an activist. Um, and so for uh, example, like, I would notice that in the US, um, uh, the Palestinian solidarity movement here would exalt figures who were considered questionable uh, in the grassroot Palestinian, two grassroot Palestinian activists. Um, and this is just sort of like one example that I'm talking about. There's others, obviously. Uh, so I'm sort of wondering, like, if we could, if you could all maybe talk a little bit more about um, the t the tensions and um, is it um, uh, and like how do you re represent maybe those tensions in your work um, in a way that doesn't undermine um, the solidarity movements that you all sort of touched upon in the talks today. Shall I go first? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great, uh, you know, thank, thank you very much, Lumina. It's a great question. Um, and also uh, your experience uh, that you had uh, is very enlightening. Um, I, I would say that we should be very cautious. Uh, we, uh, uh, people who actually care about uh, uh, the vast majority of humanity uh, about taking any kind of support from uh, NGOs, especially uh, organizations that posture as human rights organizations uh, and so forth. Um, and that, um, uh, you know, so for instance, uh, in the United States, uh, many of those are uh, funded by the, um, the National Endowment for Democracy and a number of uh, US uh, Democratic and Republican Party uh, leaders who would like to see the end uh, and the expulsion, uh, not the expulsion, the, the basically ending any kind of movement whatsoever. So they, they try to, uh, ex, ex, you know, kind of like bring to an end any kind of political movement as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, support them, obviously. Um, I've seen this happen over and over again. Uh, I think, uh, you know, of course, the NGO report 
strikingly that took place uh, 10 days ago uh, from, I think it was 10 days ago or 15 days ago by Human Rights Watch was a real exception to the rule in terms of how it characterized Palestine and the, the occupation. And I don't know why that took place, but I'm sure there's an ulterior motive. But I would say that uh, on the whole, I, I would not trust uh, NGOs uh, of any kind. And I actually wouldn't even trust anybody from the West to tell you the truth, uh, including myself. <laughs> so, I mean, I, what I mean is that you have to actually build trust. And that's something that does not come through money. It doesn't come through uh, anything, but just actually being and, and living with uh, the movements. And so that would be my short answer. Thank you, Manny, and thank you, Lubna. Um, well, I would say that uh, one of the most um, important lessons that I have learned and continue to learn because it's a hard lesson uh, from comrades organizing here and in different parts of the world where there is um, a uh, where there is a National Patriotic Alliance or Bayan that supporting um, the uh, National Democratic Movement here is um, their constant effort to um, really expose uh, the binarism between reform and revolution. Um, even someone as reactionary and pro-imperialist uh, uh, like Samuel Huntington uh, once said that um, the most reactionary, the most powerful bourgeois in power would know that without a revolutionary movement, there can be no reforms. And how is this uh, translated organizationally? Um, it's always important to remember, I think, and my comrades uh, constantly remind me of this, that um, there are there's a set of um, uh, methods of work um, and campaigns uh, that can serve uh, our uh, tactical goals and strategic goals. Right. So those are two uh, uh, very important elements of organizing and building a broad united front um, against imperialism, and fascism, and building democracy towards a, a bright socialist future, uh, which can also guide our uh, the way we um, say, for example, approach um, liberal democratic organizations, liberal democratic remedies, uh, for example, in terms of um, addressing human rights violations, right? And uh, also, so the point is, um, there is no basis for a movement, for an anti-imperialist movement uh, that also takes into account the importance of um, winning or uh, making a victory for the proletariat to, uh, to contain, um, for example, our, um, our organizing, um, or to actually, yeah, to contain it and say that uh, we can only uh, organize along liberal democratic lines. So it's always important to um, distinguish between what can do, what we can do immediately, and um, and how to actually also build power and reach out to the most number of people who can support our um, well uh, tactical goals. But also that shouldn't affect our uh, long-term uh, vision, our strategy, uh, what we really need, uh, well, to end um, exploitation and, and oppression. So I think there's a really a need for, um, for activists, for organizers to understand that uh, reform and, and revolution, they, they go hand in hand. And also there's a way of addressing reformists. That's, I think that's different. Being a reformist and being a reformer are, are also two different things. Yeah, I really, I really, I really resonate a lot, and I really liked um, what you said, Sarah, about being able to distinguish, um, you know, tactics and strategy, which is a perennial kind of question. Um, and part of what it reminds me so so much about was, you know, um, and and for my own journey, probably involved actually knowing South African history as history, as opposed to a reference point, which I think when I was younger, I, um, it was, it was easy to kind of point it as a reference point, but being able to actually delve into South African history and think about um, be, being able to actually plan for the day after the day after the end of apartheid, 
um, is so crucial um, as, as, as a lesson for us, right? It's like, it reminds me of Amiko Cabral saying, you know, claim no lies um, and uh, or claim no easy victories, tell no lies and claim no easy victories. And I think that that's really vital because we know that the end of apartheid in Palestine doesn't necessarily mean freedom for everyone, freedom for um, people to be safe in their homes and in, in, in all of the ways, right? And so being able to actually know history and actually um, take those as strategy and as tactics is vital for us to be prepared when kind of revolution happens. That's a great transition, I think, to uh, a question that we got from uh, someone in the audience. So the question is, um, given Manny's comment on uh, prolonged uh, de facto apartheid, would the panelists comment on their visions for how we get to a post-apartheid horizon? Who would like to start us off? Well, I, I could start. Uh, if we're talking about apartheid, there are many apartheids uh, that exist throughout the world. But the, you know, of course, the one that uh, resonates the greatest today is uh, in Palestine. Um, I would argue uh, that uh, the case in in South Africa is not a, uh, a useful one in. Uh, liberating people in the sense that uh, Palestinians uh, who are at the um, uh, leading uh, segments of the movement should not look to a South African style solution, which was only agreed upon because the capitalist class of South Africa wanted to have a, a solution that would um, advance its own industries and its own profits and so forth. And that would come at the expense of the vast majority of the, pe the people in the uh, country. Now, uh, some 90% of all South Africans are Black, Black South Africans. Uh, and um, the level of inequality, the Gini coefficient is the highest in the world. So um, one can expect the same thing to happen in a place uh, like Palestine, um, and that uh, we really have to shoot for something that is uh, far more um, comprehensive in terms of, uh, in the case of, you know, very clearly with respect to Palestine, uh, there, there needs to be uh, uh, an expulsion of the land away from the population that's stolen it uh, for the last 80 years or so and uh, return to uh, those people who control it. Uh, the same thing uh, applies to South Africa, where, um, and this is a point that was made very well uh, by uh, Gabriel, uh, that, you know, agriculture is crucial. And in, in South Africa, you know, the people who own the land are uh, maintaining control over it. And um, it's a thing that people can completely forget, um, including myself at times, but not anymore, that, you um, there are more people who live in rural areas today than at any time in the history of the world, even though we talk about an urbanizing planet. Of course, even people who are living in urban areas are living in rural areas in some respects that don't have running water, do not have electricity, do not have the basic uh, staples. Um, so, I, I mean, uh, I have to be very blunt about it in, in my uh, thought uh, that I think, and I, but I also don't want to say it in an off-handed way because I think it's so... Uh, you know, somewhat uh, crucial to and to take seriously that we have to think of overthrowing these governments, and and how you do that is uh, not. Uh, you know, I think we, we need strat. It was you know pointed out earlier by by Sarah, you know, strategy, tactics, etc., are very important, and uh, you, you know you you do it through. Uh, building a movement and a powerful movement. I said that before in my short talk, I, I feel that uh, the movement has to be organized or it will go nowhere. Um, and I think that the dominant left vision today is that that's a good thing, uh, that they take uh, solace and comfort in the fact that people are actually protesting 
without getting anything in return. Uh, I, I view the world as a place where people do continue continually protest, and there's no more protest today than there was at any other time. The problem is that we don't have organization, and with a working class organization committed to a transformation, anti-imperialism, the end of capitalism, or uh, an end to the kind of capitalism that we have today and building a socialism is what we really need. And that means going back to some ideas that people might find, uh, uh, un, you know, they may, find, may say that they're old and so forth, but I actually think that they're at the cutting edge. Uh, you know, the idea of state control over uh, an economy to me sounds like a very good idea. So for instance, in the Philippines, if uh, the state really did have control over the economy, which means the people, that would transform the country overnight. Uh, that would be true for many other places, as long as it is a state that is, like I said, democratic in terms of its representation. But I think you asked, you know, uh, you know, a touchstone question that is very important, but hard one, you know, I mean, if I want to be blunt about it, I could, but I think we have to take it very seriously about what's necessary. That's why I go to South Africa all the time. I, I see it as a place where transformation is possible. Yeah, I mean, if, if we're talking also specifically about um, Israeli apartheid, um, I, it, like in 2005, the Palestinian uh, um, solidarity movement called for the boycott, divestment and sanctions, which was which is a strategy that has been inspired by South Africa, right? Um, and it is a strategy, a strategy that Israel um, has really fought uh, quite a bit over the last decade and a half, uh, because um, it is working in ways that I think like other things haven't worked. Um, and so, um, yeah, and I mean, I, I take inspiration from the fact that like um, it, it, Italian dock workers are refusing to uh, load uh, weapons onto ships that are going to head to Israel, right? That's, that's the kind of thing I think that uh, those are the kind of strategies that can help um, get us to a post-apartheid uh, horizon. Gabrielle, you had a comment? Yeah, no, I completely, completely agree, um, Lubna, with you, especially the, uh, the point on dock workers. Um, I'm always, when, when talking to folks who were part of the uh, movement uh, the, uh, to support liberation in Southern Africa, so many of them focus on dock workers refusing to unload as such an integral part. Um, when we're thinking about apartheid, I, I was trying to think of, of one thing, and I really came back actually to the doctrine of discovery, um, which was uh, the military theological docu uh, document that um, was that uh, the Pope put into place in, um, after a series of, of verdicts um, to wage war on the rest of the world. And it is from that doctrine that we get the idea of terra nullius. Um, it is a doctrine that continues to govern the day-to-day um, -day lives legally for many indigenous people around the world. It is the basis of most constitutions um, in settler regimes. It is also the basis of the idea of a land um, of, uh, of a land without uh, people for a people without a land, um, the, such, the settler doctrine of Israel. And it is precisely what many indigenous people have called um, on, other, on others to support the ending of. So, um, you know, I would say that when trying to think about how land is so central to being able to end global apartheid. Go ahead. Sarah, did you have a comment or? No, those are very excellent points. I have nothing more to add. Okay, Thank you. Great. Um, okay, so our next question, um, let's see. Uh, so unfortunately, Nick had to leave. And so this might have been a question that um, his take would have been uh, great on. But um, there's a question about, um, do you think that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples will be the driving force 
of indigenous rights in the coming years? Um, I don't know if anybody wants to take a, a crack at this question. Uh, this question. Um, I always sort of um, feel um, weird about the United Nations as a Palestinian. You know, the United Nations is the organization that um, de declared and legitimized uh, was the organization that first declared and legitimized Israel in 1948. Um, and so, and that was one of the very first things that the United Nations did when it was created. Um, and so, um, yeah, but could it, could that declaration be a driving force for indigenous rights? What do y'all think? Gabriel, do you want to try? Oh, no, I, th I thought that I saw Sarah's um, mic going off, so I didn't know. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, I, 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 that, that, that's, out, that's out, of my, out of my lane, honestly. Um, the only part that I will say is, um, you know, I think it goes back to the questions of strategies and tactics that we had talked about mm -hmm. before, um, while recognizing, right, that the UN has military occupying forces worldwide. Yeah. Definitely. And um, I think like, yeah, this is out of my lane too. I think like it's it's important to remind people that like uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand and the United States all voted. Uh, they're the only four countries who voted against that declaration. Um, there's um, actually an essay uh, by Alyosha Goldstein. Um, I think it's titled Where the Nation Takes Place. And he uh, says that um, uh, that the U.S. refused, and I'm guessing the same thing with Canada and uh, Australia, that they've refused to justly deal with um, their in indigenous people um, because that that uh, dealing with it is a, a threat to them, right? It's the, a threat to the fictive uh, coherence of the settler nation state, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, I'd just like to add something to that. Um, yeah. Well, it's it, it may be an indirect, indirect point to make, but um, well, the United Nations, um, well, it doesn't have any legal teeth, right? Mm -hmm. And that is our experience with uh, the uh, so-called conflict, the maritime conflict between um, China, uh, China's nine dash claim, which affects our. Um, claims on uh, territorial claims um, in, uh, of, of the sea, right? Mm -hmm. So even if we have won the um, arbitration via the um, tribunal of the United Nations, you know, it's, it, it's not like it can impose sanctions like the U.S. does. It's not like it can impose economic embargo, etc. So um, it's, um, and if you have, uh, say, precedents like, um, Duterte, who couldn't care less what the world thinks about him, he couldn't he couldn't care less about you know being dismissed as uh, you know immoral and a murderer and so on and so forth. And so I think that's uh, there's a limit to what the United Nations uh, can do. It's it's very limited, mm -hmm. and it will always be up to um, organized groups to maximize. Uh, you know, uh, the more progressive um, so-called unities that it can forge among its uh, member nations. But we cannot rely on the United Nations to really liberate the indigenous peoples or, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I completely agree. So I think like sort of uh, what we're sort of saying is that like the United Nations and any declaration from them should not be a driving force for any, uh, um, uh, any sort of movement and instead like that needs to come from us right from uh, people organizing themselves uh, okay um, so we have a question um, let's see uh, so looking to indigenous and anti-settler uh, colonial struggles we've seen over the last few years uh, um, whether in Palestine or um, indigenous struggles in the US, how should people in the global north and the capitalist heartland engage these movements against counterinsurgency? How do socialists make themselves useful in these asymmetrical global conditions? Um, and how to grow from solidarity among struggles to a global revolutionary internationalism targeting settler colonialism and white supremacy?
I, th I think that question is very uh, broad. If it could be narrowed a bit, uh, it would be helpful. Uh, I, I think the person who wrote it obviously has an idea and I would like to hear more about it. But I, I think that um, um, we're talking about a force that has been taking place over 500 years and um, it's going to take a very long time uh, to reverse it. Uh, but you know, you have to start somewhere. Um, but the question was so broad that, um, in the sense that what we can do, uh, you know, I think we can do things on, on you know, every day to uh, advance uh, causes for uh, the rights of uh, people who've been colonized, uh, and that can be, uh, you know, achieved through, uh, you know, working with organizations such as Bion in the United States. I would say, if you really care. Uh, or working with uh, Palestinian groups uh, uh, that are legitimate in the United States. Uh, I think that's, you know, if, you know, because I'm trying to think this through, but you, you can't think about changing the world overnight. I really believe that. And you, you, you could, whatever little you can do is very important. So I would suggest uh, that that might be, uh, that question was so, it's important, but it's very broad to answer in, a minute. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can narrow it down a little bit. Um, or uh, maybe um, ask a question that's sort of related to it. So, um, Sarah, you, you mentioned um, at some point in your talk that um, class struggle is connected to anti-imperialism and the struggle uh, against anti or a struggle, the struggle against imperialism, um, and that you really can't sort of divorce these two issues from each other, right? Um, and that just sort sort of brought to my mind today um, the, a protest that I was in, um, and uh, there was a speaker there who sort of framed the struggle in Palestine as a class struggle, where um, Netanyahu's elitist and capitalist government is oppressing working class Palestinians, and um, even indirectly, maybe even. Uh, uh, um, using and um, oppressing working class Israelis, right? Um, and another speaker actually took issue with that first speaker um, and with that framing and instead wanted to emphasize uh, a settler colonial framework and that um, the working class Israelis are settlers uh, too, right? Um, so I guess like my question is, um, are there instances where a Marxist a socialist framework has its limits um, when um, addressing these like settler colonial struggles? I mean, I can unless one of y'all want to take it. Um, yeah, what, I, what I would say um, is I think that when I'm thinking about the United States, there is a framework that consistently is talked about it, that of the white working class. And what we have seen historically is a um, in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, is a consistent kind of... Um, tendency as well to support um, a, a ruling class as opposed to have class solidarity with black and indigenous people, right? So we have a, a history of class collaboration. Um, and this is kind of the point that I was trying to, to get out as well. And it's not just, it's not just white folks, there's, there's class collaboration that happens when oppressed peoples as well want to be also be oppressors. Um, and so I think that there is, uh, important history. Gerald Horn really kind of details this in his triptych or in his, tr his trilogy rather on the origins of settler colonialism of a continued um, time and time again uh, effort of, of, of the white working class um, class collaboration as opposed to class solidarity. And I think that is a point that is very important for us to consider when we try to think about international solidarity um, and some of the tensions and some of the and, and some of the roots of those tensions when we're in organizing rooms. I'd like to second what Gabriel pointed out. I think there's 
really a, a, um, a need for us to um, become um, basically uh, anti, you know, oppose our own class in some respects, uh, if we want to call it a class. Uh, because I, as I pointed out in my short comments, uh, there is an aristocracy of labor or labor aristocracy that exists. And you know better than anyone, uh, you know, without, without question, Lubna, you know that there's no question. You know, I mean, in a place like Palestine, Israel, there's Jews, uh, and I, I, you know, I don't say this in any kind of uh, discriminatory way, benefit from the oppression of Palestinians. There's, you know, period, you know, and obviously there are nuances to it. Uh, just as um, in the United States during the period of uh, Jim Crow, uh, whites benefited, uh, you know, W.B. Du Bois, incredible work, uh, why, you know, white working class people benefited from the oppression of black people. So I, I feel extremely strongly that uh, we, we have to uh, uh, understand uh, that uh, we support a working class and the working class represents the majority of the world. They live in urban and rural areas. And uh, um, that may actually mean going against our own interests. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to think of themselves as the working class. I'm sorry, uh, you know, you've got to, you know, put that, you know, analysis before me, you know, the kinds of struggles that people are having today in India, uh, for instance, are far different than the kinds of struggles that people have in, in Germany or the United States. It's a completely different dynamic. And that, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, the ability to, you know, have enough food to reach your, uh, your, your height and weight that uh, would otherwise, you know, you, you would end up stunted. And this happens uh, increasingly so, and, and we're living in a, a, a you know, crisis right now. I, I, and you, maybe you can tell us better than anyone else with respect to uh, the Zionist entity, if I may. Uh, it's no question the way that the Israelis are, are the, the Jewish Israelis are treated and the Israelis as a, Jews are treated in that country far better. And it's even ensconced in the, in the law and the constitution of the country that, you know, it's a country for Jews. And, uh, you know, that's why many people uh, in this country turned against uh, Israel because, uh, it, you know, they like to think of themselves as the democracy in the Middle East. And, and so forth. Uh, their labor movement is a complete uh, joke, as far as I'm concerned. The Histadrut. They they represent uh, very affluent uh, people uh, on the whole, and that uh, you know labor unions also represent you know mobbed up uh, operations as well. So I do believe very strongly in class struggle. I don't think all labor unions do. Uh, I think many of them are uh, corrupt in, in many instances. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have to fuggle, fight struggles on our own terrains of, without question. Uh, you know, here in, in New York City, with respect to uh, working class students at City University of New York, I'm sure that's true at the school you teach at in Seattle. Uh, yet at the same time, the kinds of struggles that we're engaged in, you know, I mean, it's right in front of our nose that we can see it. They're very different than the kinds of struggles in the third world. And, uh, I think Palestine is probably one of the most, um, if it's anything like South Africa, uh, blatant examples of um, where you have a, a working class, if you can even call them that, aristocracy uh, in that country. So. I would just like to add that, um, in fact, um, the, the warning that Marx issued was that, um, well, he, he says that you cannot understand how one nation can grow rich at the expense of another. So that's basically imperialism. And those who cannot understand that will even be less equipped uh, to understand how in the same country, one class can enrich itself at the expense of another class. But I think it's only the dominant form of Marxism uh, that, uh, you know, that, uh, that, you know, people can caricature and say that, oh, Marx was only, or Marxists are only for class politics and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but in the case of Palestine, for example, um, even if you are not a working class Palestinian, you're still, um, uh, a, um, you're still experiencing national oppression, right? Uh, because of um, the Israeli apartheid state. So 
uh, the liberation of uh, Palestine from uh, the settler colonial state of Israel will be the liberation of all classes in, in Palestine, right? Whether, um, whether uh, the victory, uh, the national democratic victory of the Palestinians, uh, whether they will pursue it or, you know, pursue the logical conclusion of this victory towards economic redistribution will, of course, be up to the, um, you know, organizations uh, uh, in, in, in Palestine, whether they will pursue uh, a, um, a, a social form that responds to human needs, right? So, um, so in a sense, uh, I would say that um, it, um, what, as for example, as activists, uh, there will be no reason for us to say um, approach non-Marxists. Like if if a person, if an activist is not Marxist, I don't think there's something wrong with that person. You know, but uh, I would think that um, there, you know, there can be unities that can be forged, and it will be up to that broad movement, right, uh, to actually uh, uh, pave the way for a future that would consider or that would 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 have primary consideration for uh, the popular classes, uh, the peasant and the workers of both North and uh, Global South. Thank you. I agree, Sarah, thank you for that. Um, okay, I think we have uh, maybe time for uh, one more um, one more question. Um, uh, so one of the, both questions that we have left are about Palestine. So what are things that people keep getting wrong about the Palestinian struggle. Do you all have any sort of um, ideas based on your uh, things you've heard about, um, like about the Palestinian movement uh, from your end or? Well, yeah, from, from, from my end, uh, we are a 80% Catholic. Right. Mm -hmm. So there is really a need to clarify that um, Israel is not uh, the Israel is not the biblical Israel. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people here kind of uh, mistake that. But of course, it's not their fault. Um, it, it only means that we have so much more <laughs> to do. Um, and second would be that um, most people, I think, not only here, but in many parts of the world. And of course, it's because of Western media. It it sees what goes on in Palestine as a conflict between two nation states. So I think those are, yeah, that's being muddled a lot. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's like very easy for people to sort of um, frame the, the struggle specifically as a religious struggle when it's very much um, a colonial struggle. Yeah. Yeah, well, go, go, go ahead, Emmanuel. Yeah, Emmanuel. Yeah, I think uh, people watch the news and it's uh, mainstream bourgeois news, that's a major problem. They don't understand the struggle. And uh, I like the way you framed it very much, Luba. We have very I think I would also just add that the struggle is not just for the um, what is on the land of Palestine. The struggle has always been international because um, one of the dangers that we get from that map that we see of a disappearing Palestine is that it doesn't allow us to actually talk about um, the rights of Palestinians in the diaspora, Palestinians in 48, um, as well as all of the peoples around the world who have sh seen in Palestine their, themselves, who have seen in Palestine their own struggles and their continued um, their continued uh, efforts for liberation. And so I think it's really vital to not have our narrative of Palestine be about what like, erasure and dispossession, but instead um, that it is an international uh, solidarity movement that has been also the reason why there is a global counter revolution against it, right? It's not just that people, it's, it's that folks on the right are also scared of the international solidarity um, campaigns and movements that have existed not just since 2005, but since the very formation um, and uh, uh, of the British mandate. 
Yeah, and I think Sir Nick also uh, mentioned this, right, is that fighting for Palestine isn't just about Palestine, right? It's fighting for the Black Lives Matter movement. It's fighting for... Um, uh, for social uh, justice, for uh, it's it's also fighting for um, indigenous people's rights because, um, as he mentions, um, the, the the tactics that are uh, being used against protesters um, in the U.S. are th our police is trained in in Israel, right? Um, the, the police here is trained in Israel. The tactics that they use are things that they've learned from the Israeli police and Israeli army. Uh, the weapons that they are using are all from Israel. So um, it's really, I think it's really important to frame Palestine as an international and global uh, struggle. Um, okay, I think we are out of time. Uh, Philip, did you have any last uh, comments before we end? No, I, I, I think, this is a wonderful discussion, which made a lot of connections. Uh, uh, I think the one of the the problems uh, it was that the uh, as speaking as an American Jewish person that and and putting it in a jokey form that uh, what would have been all right in the 19th century, given current biological ideas and ideas about colonization, stood out like a sore thumb in the 20th century when it when it was tried. And there was really no way under current political, acceptable political, th liberal political theories to justify it. You know, it can't be argued. So the, most of the energy was put into keeping the argument out of the public sphere. We can't talk to terrorists. Palestinians should not be allowed to be interviewed directly on TV in America. I think it was only in 1986 that Hanan Ashrawi and some others were on for the first time during the Reagan era. And there was a real struggle for about, uh, for a long time to get anybody to speak to a network. And so I think Israel sort of understands that for them, the struggle is in America and keeping America as its shield uh, instead of having to deal with the consequences of its actions. And, uh, uh, but I, international solidarity seems to me, and beyond solidarity, you know, one hopes that it rises beyond BDS, that there's some, some sort of equivalent to what the Cubans did to help the end of apartheid uh, by defeating the South African army. Uh, what's, the, what's the thing that will stop Israel's military might and force it to, to come to the table seriously into some kind of negotiation that brings up the diaspora and, and uh, acknowledges the Nakba and so forth. And so, uh, lots to do for all of us. You're all young, you have a lot of energy and an extraordinary amount of intelligence. So I am uh, filled with hope when I listen to you and I want to thank all of you, Lubna, Sarah, Emmanuel, well, Emmanuel, you're not young, you're my age, you went through the 60s. <laughs> and Gabrielle and uh, uh, Nick Estes as always for being part of uh, uh, this great discussion and uh, come back to Red Bank, all of you. Uh, and the last thing I want to say for the audience, aside from give money, you've heard that, is uh, join us again on Wednesday, May 10th at 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time for uh, Beyond Depression and Exploitation with Ashley Borer, uh, Michael Hart, Shannon Reddy, and Ico Day. And then at uh, uh, 5 p.m., The Asset Economy and the Logic of Speculation. Uh, which I'll be moderating. I also want to end this one by actually uh, saluting our moder moderator, Lubna, where I have the actual biography here. So what I should have read before was that Lubna grew up in Hebron, Palestine before moving to the US for graduate school, a lecturer at the University of Washington and South Seattle College. Uh, and uh, her work is on settler colonial infrastructure, necropower, and the environment in both US and Palestinian literature. So thank you, Lubna, for doing a great job. And, thank you, Philip, for inviting me. Bye, everybody. We'll see you at Red May at, on Wednesday. Hey, thank, well, let us know when we're <laughs>